Without further ado, I want to introduce our panel here. Um, we've got a, a diverse range of students. Um, we've got a catchment from the Deep South, right to the biggest Polynesian city in the world. So um, I'll, I'll get them to introduce themselves. So we'll start off with our, our Tongan queen, MJ from down to Leiden. Introduce yourself. Um, Malolele, everyone, and happy Tongan language week. My name is Mary Jane Kivalu, but everyone refers to me as MJ. I'm currently doing my first year in Doctor of Business Admin at University of Otago, where I also completed my Bachelor of Commerce and Master of Business Admin. Um, not originally from Dunedin, so I grew up in South Auckland, where all the famous people come from, Otara. Um, and um, yeah, I was basically there and then left to Dunedin um, for tertiary study, and I've been there ever since. Um, I'm the current president of the New Zealand Tongan Students Association. Um, so th this is my third year um, as president. And we're gonna, we're gonna head over to the Crusader country. I know Bale is a big Crusaders fan. And we've got uh, another Tongan queen from the sunny place of Nelson. Um, uh, my name's Hayley uh, Viatupu. And um, I uh, study at NMIT. And um, it's, a, it's a massive honour to be here, actually. It's a bit scary um, sitting out here in front of everyone, but um, it's, a, it's a huge honour, so um, thank you for having me. Um, I, am the, I was the VP for Sanity Student Association, so I've just stepped down from there so I can finish my last placement. So I'm a Year 4 social work student, and uh, countdown's on. I've got about three months to go, and... Um, I'll finally have that piece of paper in my hand, which is cool. Um, so, yeah, that's me. I'm going to head over to the capital city. My brother, um, also here, is on home soil uh, here at Victoria University, Wellington. Andre. Talo for lover. Uh, my name is Andre Lafatiti Westerland. I'm from the beautiful island of Samoa. Uh, I'm an NZA uh, scholarship student, and I'm currently doing my honours year in computer science. I'm also the president for the Pacifica Students Council here at Victoria, and it's an honor to be here in front of you guys. And this is my great friend from AUT. Uh, she's a late fill-in. If you see in the booklets, we originally had uh, Matalena from Unitech. Unfortunately, she's unwell. So um, yeah, there's big ups uh, sort of for stepping in place at, at such short notice. So I'll, I'll let her introduce herself and all the great work. Tell her, uh, explain all the work she does up in Auckland. Maloni or Talohoni, my name is Sulu Danielle Joshua. Um, I'm a Tokelauan student, first year law at AUT, so I have like four or five years to go. Um, <laughs> I am currently on, I represent the Pacifica Voice at AUT on our student council on the mainstream board, and through that I found that there was no Pacific Association, so I made one, and I'm the president of that, so... <laughs> You know, if you want to be president, just make it yourself. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, it's easy to talk about the work, but it's just about building the community up there. Like you said, we have the biggest Polynesian city in the world, and we just want to make that presence strong and known at AUT. Thank you. Uh, can we just give a, another round of applause for our students? <laughs> well, we're going to dive straight into um, chewing the fat with uh, my fellow students up here, but... The, the question we've got for these guys is, um, you know, I want to ask, you know, what are your dreams and aspirations and what's important to you as a Pacifica student here in Aotearoa? Dreams and aspirations. Um, so I've, I've never been one to limit myself to one particular area because I like to think that I can get into any <laughs> job, I don't know. But um, I guess it, in terms of ultimate goal, probably... Um, as I explained in a workshop before, I, I want to end up in a position of influence for positive change um, for my people, um, Tongan people, Pacific people, people who grew up in Otara, like all of that. So basically public sector eventually. And um, But yeah, that's dreams and aspirations. I guess what's important to me at the moment as a tertiary student in Aotearoa um, Whatever capacity I have, um, the platforms that I'm in, I want to be able to give, um, to pay it forward to the generation that follows. Um, you know, not just climbing up the ladder and pull, pulling up the ladder after me, but 
helping them climb the ladder up and then um, moving forward. Um, so that's one thing that's important to me. And then the second is just basically setting myself up um, as a person so that when I build my future, I'm not just um, I'm not just building a future for myself to be the successful person with a good life, but have a good life with and also help my family. Um, you know, as a Pacific person, that's really important. You have cultural um, responsibilities to your family, and I want to be able to fulfill those responsibilities without the expense of a good life. So getting to have the best of both worlds, basically. Uh, I guess in terms of uh, short-term goals, for me it's really about finishing and uh, my qualification, and um, that's a pretty big deal for me, uh, for my family, uh, and for my son, actually. Uh, so I came from a big family in Nelson, so there was four other siblings, and uh, further education wasn't the norm. So um, a big part of, of my goal and my aspiration is, um, yeah, changing that, I guess. Um, when I started my uh, Bachelor of Social Work, my son was five, so he was in year one and I was in year one. Um, so that's been really cool to have that journey with him. And so we sit down and we do our homework together and, uh, you know, it's pretty standard on a Friday to, you know, uh, kind of flop on the couch and just be shattered because... We've been learning the whole week. Um, so I get that. Um, now he's year four, almost nine, and um, I guess the idea of uh, lifelong learning for him and um, uh, further study, that is his norm. He gets it. So I'm proud to say that I've created a new norm in my family. Um, so that's been a big goal for me. Uh, long term, um, I would like to build on my community work at Pacifica Trust and um, kind of create a space uh, where uh, youth families can see it's okay to study uh, later on as an adult and you can still do it even if you're working or uh, if you have church commitments or you're involved in the community, you can still do it. So um, that's a big part for me. And... Uh, representing New Zealand-born Pacifica um, youth, I guess. Um, I think it's a really tough road, um, especially if you don't tick all of the boxes. As, um, uh, as a New Zealand-born Tongan, I, I don't tick many of the kind of traditional kind of concepts um, or tikanga, I guess. Um, so, yeah, it's, that's my goal, was to kind of create a space... Um, where that's okay, you can be New Zealand born and it doesn't matter if you don't speak your language or if you're discovering your identity, it's still okay to kind of put your hand up and say, yes, I'm, I'm Pacifica. Can you repeat the question, please? Hello. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to ask, yeah, what are your dreams and aspirations and what's important to you as a Pacifica student here in New Zealand? Yeah, I know you're from Samoa and... You know, come here to a, a different world, and I you know, just, just want to ask, like, what's important to you in that aspect, and and you know, what are your dreams and aspirations? Because I know you know, it, your intention is to go back home and you know, make some waves, uh, tell the floor what your dreams are, really. So um, since I was like five, I've always had a passion for computers and technology. Um, you know, I was, we were in Samoa, and you know, technology wasn't as developed as New Zealand, Australia, you know, et cetera. Uh, so my dream is to thrive in the digital world. And I want to be an influential person in the technological sector in my home country. And not only like to this myself, but encourage and help others in my field as well, because we need more of those numbers. Because you see the amount of STEM students, even in New Zealand, Pacific STEM students, there's a really small amount of them in New Zealand. And, you know, there's... Um, there's things that we can do to change that, and my dream is to help change that, not, not only in like Samoa but in the region as well. And um, what, what's important to me as a tertiary student in Aotearoa is um, just academic guidance as well as my well-being. And I'm sure that every other um, student should have those rights as well. Um, yeah, yeah thank you. Thanks, Liz.
Um, so my dreams and aspirations personally is a bit childish. Just want to be happy. Um, yeah, so that's mine. But I mean for Pacifica and what I do at uni, my dreams and aspirations for them is to create a space really, like I said, just to let them feel like they have that place of belonging because, you know, the name Pacifica in itself is so powerful, you know, and if there's nothing around it, they... Um, Based on feedback, our students feel to tend like they tend to feel a bit lost, like there's nothing for them, and it's just offering that support. And I hope by the time I leave in the next how many years, there's that strong foundation for Pacifica. So when they come, they know that we're here for them. So, yeah, it's my dreams and aspirations. Thank you. I think I can add to that as well since I'm I'm a student too. So why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> So for me, my dreams and obviously aspirations is I want to be a homeowner here in New Zealand. Um, uh, I grew up with a lot of people who grew up in state housing, and um, I know when you know their grandparents passed away, you know they had to you know move away, and it was quite hard for them to find a house. And I just want security for for myself, and hopefully if I have kids, maybe we'll see. But uh, <laughs> but uh, and because um, I know obviously. You know, I know Lord Manavau highlighted today that you know, although we're the fastest growing population here in New Zealand, um, you know, our academic and our pay grade isn't up to, isn't on par with everyone else in this country. And our home ownership um, percentage for Pacific people in general is is quite low. And um, you know, house pricing here in New Zealand is, is skyrocketing. And you know, I want to want to be a homeowner. I don't want to be have a mortgage and get mortgage free one day, like my grandparents. So, um, and yeah, that's my dream, and um, like, like everyone else, is to um, make it a norm for, every, for our Pacific people uh, to make change and be confident in their own brown skin and you know, be a voice and, and be a powerhouse. And uh, you know, what I think is important for me as a student here in New Zealand is, is, is the Pacific student voice and students as partners with, with decision makers and people who write our, I guess you could say, assignments and essays and and whatnot, because um, you know, without without us, I mean, essentially, it's nothing about us without us. So that that's that, that sticks through my head, and that's probably key um, for me as a student here in New Zealand. But um, it was awesome to hear what my fellow students up here talked about, what their aspirations are, and and their goals. And we know that it requires hard work and dedication. And and I want to talk more about that hard work because. Um, you know, we had to work hard. Well, for us to achieve those goals and dreams, you know, obviously we've got to work hard, but to get there, we've got to work hard in the classroom and outside the classroom. You know, we've got a lot of commitments outside and responsibilities outside of our study. And we've got family, we've got our own kids, um, we've got part-time jobs, and we've got to help out the home and in our communities and church groups. So, so that leads us on to our next question, and I want to talk more about the, the hard work that we do here in university ITPs, PTEs, ITOs, and ACE. Um, I just want to ask my fellow students um, to get them to think about you know, two assignments or a series of assessments that, you know, that they really enjoyed and ones that they didn't enjoy so much and reflect on why they loved it or reflect on why they hated it. Yeah, it's all right, be honest, because um, there's people in this crowd who, who um, I guess, write those assignments for us. So whatever we say, it can obviously help you know, the young ones coming through. So um, you know, it's, there are people here that, that care about what, what we're going through, so, and they can learn something from us to go out there and make changes in, in their curriculum and, and so forth. So yeah, I'll start off with you, Sulu. So um, an assignment that I did like is the research, um, the, re the research ones that get you to explore your culture. I think ones that really bring it home like that, they keep me more engaged, and I find that with a lot of my classmates that took the same assignment, really enjoyed that one as well. One I didn't like, um, not there's, there hasn't been one so far. It's more just the deadlines and you know normal student kind of problems, like you know when you leave it to last minute, don't pro you know don't procrastinate, but. You know, just normal student problems. But otherwise, from the board, because I'm also on the student board, a problem that we have come up is different faculties, when you submit late, there's different penalties. Yeah. So maybe you might lose 5% straight away, or others you'll lose the grade as it goes on. So I think just trying to get that whole uni, like pan-uni um, system in place. So it's a, the same across the board where one will... You either lose 5% as a whole, or everyone grades day by day 
the later it goes. So I think just keeping it consistent so everyone's on the same page. Be good feedback for those listening. <laughs> I guess as a STEM student, um, like an assessment I didn't like was those ones where they use those mathematical notations that just throw you off. And um, you know those ones where they use like real hard terms that you know we as Pacific students, we, when we grow up, we, we don't understand those. We don't, you know, even though I, I go to tutorials, I see, um, you know, I go see like a Balangi or like a non pacifica tutor. They would explain to me how this would work, how a formula would work and all that, and I still wouldn't understand. But if I had like a, like a, um, a brown face there telling me and breaking it down for me, I would, I would understand better. But then, so that's what I don't like. The assessment I don't like is just like those ones that are just really aimed at, um, you know, just like how, like, you know, like notations and all that kind of stuff, mathematical, um, like things that kind of throw you off. But then the assessments that I did like were ones that reflected real life situations. So one of them would be, um, in my case, uh, databases. Everyone's got databases. Every organization has got a database. And like, they all reflect real life situations. And in that, um, I really enjoyed those, and I, I, I like learning about those because, you know, like for my, fu in my future, like I'm gonna like handle stuff like that. So, you know, like I, I would like to the assessments. I would like to have more as just ones that reflect real life situations. And yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, an assessment that I loved uh, was in year one uh, with our Tapu paper. So they uh, base a lot of that around. I guess the difference between the Treaty of Waitangi and Te Tiriti. Um, they looked at New Zealand history, they talked about um, dawn raids, they talked about really uh, kind of relevant stuff, so they linked in a lot of, um, I think, a lot of stuff that you miss in school and a lot of uh, things that were relevant um, to the people in the class. So we were lucky we had a good tutor, she knew us, she had a relationship with us. So she extended the learning and included the stuff that was relevant to the, to the students in the class. Um, we also had to um, create uh, our mihi, and that sounds like a pretty simple assessment, but um, that prompted a, a, a really good learning for me because when you're asking questions like, who are you and where are you from, and what is your whakapapa, uh, if you don't know that, it's... And you should know that uh, going into practice as a social worker, you should be really grounded in who you are. Um, so I had some knowledge, but actually uh, it prompted me to go and visit family and uh, sit and have a chat to my uncle um, about where he grew up. And um, I found all of this amazing stuff in my family. And um, I created a really simple mihi, but I had these great chats with my family. And... Um, that, it was uh, a good assessment, but I think the difference, the thing that made it such good learning was that the tutor had done the groundwork, so she knew us, she knew what to include, um, she gave us extra resources, she printed off stuff, and she gave me stuff that she knew that I would want to read, so that was an uh, awesome learning. Um, we do a lot of reflective writing. Uh, in social work, uh, and that's required for registration, but it's also good practice. And this year, the paper that I'm currently finishing, we have, I think, five out of the six assessments are written assessments with reflective writing. I don't understand why we can't uh, sit down a, uh, in a small group and break that down and have a chat and have a teacher sitting there to say, yeah, you've got it, you know what you're doing. Um, they can ask the right questions, they can see that we're digging a bit deeper, but every assessment is written. So I think, uh, for me, I'd like more opportunities for, I guess, live assessments, or being assessed um, while I'm doing stuff. Like, I don't, I want it to be kind of a natural process, so um, I struggle with, yeah, I guess, yeah, really, you know, sort of hard and fast structure. Um, assessment, assessments that I liked. So I, th I think that's kind of what drew, drew me to the business school was that, um, so in Otago Business School, we don't have the luxury of having a Pacific lecturer. So Pacific content in our um, studies is kind of out of the question. Um, but the assessments that I liked in uh, my area of study was that 
um, they would deliver the the literature and the theories and the frameworks, um, but the assessment was that you had to apply it um, to to your workplace or like a um, something that is in your personal life, and that application part of the assessment allowed me to apply it to to my Pacific background, which I liked because um, when you had to sit down with the lecturer, you could easily I could easily argue my point um, as to why things were like, and then the lecturer was obviously like, oh, that was very that was very interesting. Why is this like that? And I could explain the cultural context behind it because the lecturer didn't understand themselves. So those are the types of assessments I liked, um, the applicable ones that I could use. Um, one I, ones I don't like, um, growing up as a Tongan, my time, my, t- my everyday time didn't belong to me. Um, it belonged to my parents. So all my free time, you know, my mum would find literally like a cupboard or a wall to scrub. Like, <laughs> my time didn't belong to me. And so time management when you enter tertiary study is, is a huge struggle because growing up you with your Pacific parents, you have to watch and learn. And then you go into school and then you have to watch, listen and learn. And then you go into tertiary study and you have to like watch, listen, feel like, and then think about it and then learn. So... Um, 13 weeks of trying to manage my studies, I hated it, those assessments. So undergrad was a huge um, struggle for me. And then um, I, when I did my MBA, my papers were every six weeks, so I had to do two papers every six weeks for my first year of my master's. And my grades in my master's is like very different. You'll think it's two different people. Um, because it was just bam, bam, smash out. Like, I just had to do everything and it was out of the way rather than sit there and be like, oh, my assignment's coming up in six weeks. I have heaps of time. And then you just sit there and then you put everything else first until the assignment comes up and then, oh, I've got to submit, I've got to submit something at least. So, yeah, I, I didn't like the long periods of time because I, at the time, I didn't know how to manage my time properly. Um, and yeah, I guess that just comes down to transitioning from one lifestyle to another, I guess. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll add on to that as well. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I'll start with the low light. Um, for me, you know, I came to university, I didn't have UE, and one of my first assignments was a lit review, and I was like, what the heck is that? <laughs> but, um, you know, I didn't use the support services, I, I failed. And, and then I learned from that mistake and then I actually went and asked for help and then the next time I had a lip review, I got an A. So uh, I didn't like a lip review, so I, I hope I don't have to write another one. Um, but I want to talk about one assessment that I really, really loved. And that's when I was back at Fitzerea at the Trades Campus. Um, so we are building um, a Habitat for Home, or home, home for Habitat. And um, you know, the, just the environment there, like it was real practical, real life experience. Um, you know, we got to, I was doing an electrician, uh, electrician course, sorry. Um, and we got to work, learn how to work with other tradies. So with the plumbers, the roofers, the builders. And we had the odd um, uh, civil engineering student from Wealthy come across and set some stuff up. And, and we actually had Victoria University architects design the house, which was, which was pretty awesome. So a student initiative, or student, I guess, planned and built um, um, assignment. So you know, I got to wire up a whole house. I didn't get to make it live because I wasn't competent. So, so that, that wasn't the fun part. But um, actually just learning to work with your other peers that you'll actually get, get out in the industry and work with, which was awesome and uh, something I'll never forget. And, and I, I live near the house that we built. So every time I drive past, I'm like, yeah, I wired up that, that house. So, so if anything happens, then it wasn't my fault, it was my classmates. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so hopefully, hopefully um, some of you guys in the crowd um, learned a thing or two from the stuff that we really enjoyed as students in the tertiary sector and some stuff we didn't, don't really like. So um, maybe you could take that on board and tell your boss on Monday. Um, but um, I want to move into our next question. Uh, earlier today, we had that government panel. It was pretty intense, but exciting. Um, <laughs> panel there, heaps of information that I learned and I'm sure a lot of you learned as well. 
but um, I just want to ask Solu, um, you know, how do you think, I guess, government agencies or your own tertiary institution, the AUT, can you know, better recognise the contribution that your family makes, your community makes, or um, that it makes towards your success? So. Um, I think holding people accountable would be a good start for those that work in the institution that are supposed to be for us. Um, that would be a good one. And just transparency for those that were supposed to be linking up with, um, making sure that they're on the same page as us, as they're there for us. I hope that doesn't hurt anyone's feelings, but, you know, it's just, it's about just being interactive and being able to communicate what works for us students and how our institution can help and maybe what we can help do for our institution. It goes both ways. Um, it's about really just helping each other to build the community. You don't want to just be talking at your students, you know, you want to talk with them. Um, there's something that Ali told me about co-creation. So, you know, you want to co-create with your students, not just consult them and go away and then, you know, treat, treat us like products. So thanks, Ali, <laughs> for that. But um, I think that's it's just a really good start. And in terms of family being involved, I think, like, I heard other institutions today, they have a family day. And I'd really love to implement something like an orientation for Pacifica, because our families play a big part. Like our sister said over here, our time at home is not our time. It's our time to clean the cupboards and, you know, <laughs> so all of that stuff. And, if you know, our family really come, and our mothers and our nanas and my dad and everyone, my brothers, if they were to come and just really see so we can build that bridge with our family and the institution, just like in primary school, so they know where we're at and what our journey is going to look like and how they can help us and maybe we might not be able to clean the cupboard on Thursday because we have an assignment, just to really let our voice be heard, you know. Um, I know that in Pacifica communities, our parents also think if we tell them, oh, we can't clean it, sorry, we've got our assessment. It's like, don't talk back. <laughs> but it's like, you know, it's, it's very important for us to succeed. And I think putting everyone on the same page, you know, it might take a fun or, you know, a nice feed after, but at least it's done. And at least everyone's more well-informed than us just being our own little adults, going to an institution where we don't even know what we're doing, you know, a first year, like what it's it's new for us as as for our family, but if we're all on the same page on what our journey should look like, or you know have an expectation, at least we're all running for it together. I'm not running and trying to inform my family, and then you know the expectations just shoot through the roof for you to lie and you know our students to tell folks like we're doing well, but really we struggle in silence. I think keeping them in check just really helps keep everyone together and push forward. I want to ask. Um, I wanted to ask Haley. Uh, she's a student from NMIT down in Nelson. Uh, it's a it's a regional area, and often at times, you know, the region student voice is always to me is always neglected, um, especially on a national level. Because uh, I work for NTUSA with national student voice for tertiary students, and we don't really have that much connection with um, you know, places like Nelson, places like Omuru or the West Coast, where there, there are ITPs and tertiary um, providers there. But um, I just wanted to ask, Haley, um, how do you think, I guess, government agencies can better not only recognise Pacifica students in the Tasman district, but how they can help you know, co better recognise the contribution your family makes to your success? Uh, I think regions, smaller regions, uh, really struggle for... Uh, funding and for opportunities, uh, you know, like whether that is, an example of that, I guess, uh, is uh, in terms of NMIT, where I am, uh, we have a great student association, uh, but there's nothing for Pacifica students, and by nothing I mean nothing, uh, and uh, I really didn't realise that until I was here today and I saw some of, I've, I've seen photos and I've heard uh, what everyone's doing and I know some of that comes back to funding. Um, graduation as an example, we are in the planning process of that. So um, because of, I guess of budget, I'm assuming it's budget related, uh, each student is issued two tickets each for free. Any additional tickets from that are $5 each. 
uh, if you're on placement, tickets aren't offered to the organisations that have literally um, provided you with that learning and really uffied you and they've looked after you and given you the opportunity to learn. So for me, um, some of that's tertiary, some of it is government, you know, like, and it's structural stuff because it's it's in the system, that's how they do it every year. Um, so I'm gutted that I don't have anyone from NMIT with me today because I think it would just they would have been uncomfortable, I think, um, to see how well they're not doing. Um, but uh, regions, I think, need a community hub. And Nelson, there's nothing like it. Uh, hearing some of the cool programs and um, kind of pl- actual physical places that are in the North Island and Wellington and Auckland, um, we just don't have it. So um, I guess we just have to uh, speak a little bit louder and fight a little bit harder and uh, maybe connect with a few few other organisations. Um, so yeah. Thank you. And MJ, I was going to ask you as well. Like, you know, you're a national president of. A national whole national body of Tongan students from far north to deep south, and I just want to ask, how can government agencies better support you know, the success of uh, NZTTSA? And and I know Otago, you know, Otago and Tofila has been a great advocate and big supporter, huge supporter of Pacifica students down in, in Dunedin. And, and I just want to ask, like, how, how can they better contribute to the success of the things you're doing down there? To be honest, we'll start with the policies. They're too Western. Um, and they don't move. They don't move for Pacific people. It's like it's like this thing where it's like, no, that, that doesn't um, meet our criteria. Um, and it's simple stuff. Like, you think it doesn't affect the students, but um, being allowed to, to go home, like being in Dunedin, majority of the students come from out of town. And being allowed to miss class to go home you know, it has to be someone direct. For example, I had a friend whose um, auntie passed away, but she couldn't miss class because it had to be um, it had to be a parent or a sibling or someone directly. But as a Pacific person, it's your auntie. You 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 have to go home. So I guess um, in terms of that, it's not just about having a Pacific person at the table. Um, in the loop, or even having a Pacific person to consult with. It's about these people um, making an effort to understand, um, making an effort to increase their cultural competency, because if they don't even try, then, like, how are we going to move forward um, from our side of things? So I guess that's the first thing, is to change the policies. Obviously, we've got to get up there too, but um, we have to do a better job at communicating with these people that they need to open their mind. Um, to our world so that we can bring our game to the table as well rather than us having to learn their game at the table. Um, And then I guess another thing is, um, to be honest, the engagement strategies um, haven't been quite successful. And I think um, we need to go back to Marketing 101. How um, How do these companies make profit? Because they invest into research and development for, the, mark, for the, the exact client that they need to attract. Um, so, so what is the tertiary sector doing to attract and engage with these students? Um, I've been listening to a lot of the conversations today, and to be honest, not many of you have thought about asking the students about how to improve. Everyone's like, let's work collaboratively, let's collect data and analytics and all of that, but... Hardly anyone was saying, let's ask the students why they're struggling. Let's ask them why they're not completing their degrees and help them. Um, Because the generation that's currently in the tertiary sector today, it's millennials. And and those types of people, they're looking for meaningful work. They want um, individual advancement. That's what they want. So we have to tap into that, like what the corporate companies are doing um, when they do market segmentation and stuff like that, we need to do that to our people, identify what they need, what makes them tick, and use that to create the engagement strategies. Not just using high schools as a pipeline, go into the churches, because not only will you engage with the families um, and 
reach out more to the community, but you'll be able to educate them more about the system as well so that they can understand and stop, I guess, peer pressuring their kids to go to church when they need to study because, you know, God's not going to tell you to go to hell if you don't go to church on Sunday. But you need to tell the church to stop pressuring the families, to stop pressuring the kids to do that. So, yeah, that's just the two things. Yeah, I love the enthusiasm, and you know, there's a straight-up challenge to everyone out there, and take some notes, tell your boss on Monday. <laughs> but yeah, and I want to add, I want to add to that as well. Sorry, sorry. But um, I think you know, in terms of like transitions from I guess compulsory sector to tertiary sector, a lot of our parents don't understand how the tertiary education works. So I think just getting them in the in the thick of things will will help make a difference. That's a real short one. But um, leading on to the next question, um, I want to ask Andre, you know, how's your education experience helping achieve your goals and um, developing your professional skills? And you know, if so, what's hindering those goals and skills from realising its potential? Um, so, sorry, what was the first one? The first bit? The first one, first one was like, how's your education experience helping achieve your goals and your, developing your professional skills and uh, what's hindering those, those skills and um, goals from um, realising its potential. Okay, sweet. So just to recap, my goal is to thrive in the digital world and help others alongside me. Um, so what I've learned so far, my four years being here, um, is a massive like, skill set, like different like programming languages, systems, all that kind of stuff in tech. And that... Like, I do feel confident that I have the skills to, you know, work for a company and then, like, do the job straight away. Um, I did a summer internship last year at Datacom, and uh, we worked on databases and all that and real-life stuff, and that really kind of, like, enhanced my skill set and, like, my, my experience and, you know, like, my perspective on the things. And, um, like, I, I have learned a lot of skills being here in uni, like, something I wouldn't learn, like, on my own. Um, and what... Uh, so I, I'm still on my journey to, to, you know, getting into the digital world. Obviously, I'm still in uni. Um, and what's hindering that is pretty much, like, the learning curve. So when I started um, first year, uh, when I started computer science first year, engineering and all that, there were 10 um, Pacific students. And by the end of our undergrad, there was only two of us that completed it. And, um, yeah, that actually sends out, like, a massive, um, like, message and th there are positives to it. Like, I read a story one time where um, there was a student, a high school student in Auckland. He, um, he went to one of the Microsoft competitions. I don't know if you guys heard about that. And he, like, really thrived in that. And, you know, it's, it's things like these where... Um, things like these where you have to, like, you have to get out of your comfort zone. So there is a learning curve there to STEM subjects. And that, that is what's hindering most of the PASI students in like the STEM uh, sector. And what we can do is just to bridge that gap is to, to reach out to them more. Um, have, you know, when you talked about like, you know, high school and pipelines and stuff, you can even go like, uh, you can start going early, early in the childhood, like start teaching STEM when they're like, what, like in like year five, year four. And that can create a passion because if, because like what Ali said in the beginning, he said, oh, I, I don't like science. Like most plus students you come across, they'll be like, nah, I don't like science. Most of them would go towards, you know, arts or commerce. And there's nothing wrong with that. But then, you know, we do need a lot of, it's like that, the kid who um, thrived in the Microsoft competition in America, he's an example reflection of what Pacific students can do in the STEM sec sector. Is any other parts of the question? Yeah. And yeah, added more to it, which is awesome. So even better. Don't, don't worry. Uh, Mino's you know, telling me to hurry up. But um, I want to I ask um, ask you another question while you're there. So I just want to ask, hey, what's missing in education? <laughs> okay, and, sweet. And what will make the biggest difference? Okay, um, so what's missing in education? So just this one line I have in my head is um, just teaching students how to think and fend for themselves. Because as, like, you know, growing up, you don't learn taxes and stuff like that. You don't learn how to, like, you know, use computers. And so, so it's just, like, these, like, essential skills that um, students need before they get into tertiary education. Like, 
there's those skills that need to be taught in high schools or even like in families and stuff in communities that can you know help them like get ahead because um like in in stem like education like in terms of stem um the so non pacifica students asians balangis when they all start like uh tech science courses when they start learning, they're like ahead of the class. Like all of them are like on point with the lecture. They're like they know they're like nodding. They know what they're talking about. Like the lecture is like talking. Whereas Pacific students, we just blank and like we'd watch the lectures again and again. We just don't understand what's going on. And um, what's missing is just having more like Pacific in uh, alumni in um, STEM. Just reaching out to the to the young ones and encouraging them that you know even though it's hard work, even though like science is hard. You know, you guys can do it, and like once you overcome that, then um, you can also be a part of the technological wave that's going to take all the busy students just up and up and just thrive in the digital world. Oh, you're talking to me before outside about you know, what your dream is to go back to Samoa with, say, like Vic. Some of the great things that I know some of the institutes here in New Zealand are doing in the regions. I know Otago is doing some great work in, in the medicine area, going back to Samoa and teaching over there. Victoria's launched their nursing program in Samoa, and um, Andre had you know, hopes and dreams about possibly um, a STEM sort of thing um, going back to Samoa. Yeah, yeah so... Can you um, elaborate on that? You, you're telling me outside. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I'm an NZA student, and obviously the, the scholarship is to, you know, upskill these certain people here, like overseas, and then take them back home where they can contribute to the development of the countries. And then obviously there's limited scholarships and it won't be fair on like other people that are working hard as well. And you know, to, to help out with that is just to um, send out outreaches, workshops and all that to um, back to Samoa and the universities, upskill the staff there or at, um, working at tertiary edu level in Samoa. And then that way they can you know, focus on their students. So for example, um, there's a networking, um, the networking faculty here, they, one of the, lecturers or professors, he went over to Samoa and he taught a one week um, course on like cyber security and all that. And I know that that um, meant a lot to, to the students in um, the National University of Samoa. And then from there, they can just spread out to, you know, to the other students that are keen on learning, you know, those, those skills. And um, also, so over here at Vic, I'm part of the, I'm part of the um, Pacifica and Maori uh, like STEM organization, so it's called Atero Poafino, and me and Ali um, are part of that, and we do outreaches to um, communities in like Puridua, Loha, even out in like um, like Fakatane and all that, where, where like less privileged kids, they don't know anything about like, you know, science, technology and all that, and then we go out there to show them like what's out there for them, instead of like the usual, um, like the usual like, you know, like doctor, lawyer and all that kind of stuff, you know, we want to stimulate the um, science interests for like Pacifica students at, at a young age, and then from there they can make better choices. Yes, yes, you can um, just to add what's missing, I think effective communication, please, with student voices. Um, Student-led initiatives really drive more students to come. If that would, you know, if that could be something that we could all work on. Um, also, please look after yourselves. I know you guys um, overwork yourselves as university staff. Don't be afraid to take a step back. I know it's a different ball game with students, but it's an honest and you know really heartfelt message that your health, mental health comes first. It's a lot that we go through as Pacifica that we don't want to talk about, but I'm here to you know raise it and let you know that it's okay. Um, just to take a step back and kind of just refocus and you know relax. Also, um, yeah. So, yeah, effective communication with students, effective communication with our families and our communities, especially as Pacifica, because we don't come alone, we get our degree as a whole. It takes a village to raise a child. It also takes the same village to get them across the stage with that degree in their hand. Um, and also, please don't wait. I know we talked about stats today, about the dropout, but we see it, you know. We, as students, our friends, sometimes it's the hard life, us friends are the ones that sometimes don't come to class, then you get that Facebook message that, oh, you know, just taking a gap break or whatever. And and I know that, you know, you see in your classrooms that, you know, the Pacifica students that were once coming aren't coming anymore. You know, don't wait. 
try, um, you know, what you can. As, as a student myself, there's no mentoring for Pacifica. I'm trying to implement that, and I have to work on passion because I have no funds. So, you know, doing what I can. But otherwise, please do what you can, but put yourself first. Okay. Yeah, so, oh, sorry, back to STEM again. Uh, so, like, obviously, when I, as I said, 10 of us started first year, and then by end of our undergrad, two of us were left. Um, now, this year, like, I know a lot of first years, there's, like, about like 10 of them, and I personally mentor all 10 of them on the side. Um, like I give them amount of time to help them understand and break them because a lot of them are struggling and obviously like affected communication. Because a lot of the Pacifica students, what they feel is when um, they step into these STEM subjects is that like when, when they like converse with like, you know, fellow classmates that are not Pacifica, they feel like they're dumb. They feel like they don't like know what they're talking about. And then that's why I said earlier that, you know, it would be easy to have a brown face to help them out. And um, yeah, well-being is an important part as well of um, these students. If you keep put that first, uh, so so what I said before is um, you need to teach students how to think and fend for themselves earlier in life, and then to um, to see how the to see how that to evaluate that by seeing if there's any skills gained and who should be involved is just um, alumni, families, and communities and all that. So now we're going to take it to the floor. So we're going to ask some questions from the crowd. So if you want to ask us a question, pick our brain, go hard. Anyone got a question for fellow panelists or myself? I've just got a comment. I think you all answered amazingly, and I really like the fact that you have challenged us to do the right thing. So well done to all of you. We can give ourselves a pat on the back. But uh, any other questions? Thanks, Sam. Any questions? Marcelino? Thank you guys for sharing your experiences. Um, my question is regards to what I've seen through my uh, the road show that we've done over the last couple of years is that students are really busy. You guys are running networks and evenings of all sorts. Do you think your extracurricular activities outside of your academic lives, not just yourselves, but your peers, how is that impacting on your ability to do well at school? I want to take that question. Yeah. Um, I think it does, but it adds so much uh, to your learning journey. Like, uh, you aren't walking across that stage by yourself, you know, like, I, I think uh, you need to stay connected with your community and with your church to, to kind of get through. But I guess it's um, maybe teaching students in high-pressure times to talk to the people that they're working with and say, look, I, you know, I've got an exam in a couple of days. I, I, can't, I can't help with this this week. So I think some of it is about... Um, Maybe students being um, a bit more assertive um, is something I got better at doing. In year one, I just got completely swamped, um, and it was hard. Uh, but now at year four, um, I'm OK with saying no. Um, still doing some, and still staying connected, but I think it, um, it definitely uh, it impacts your study. It impacts your ability to hand uh, assessments in on time. Yeah. Sorry, so as a first year, that's something that I'm not good at right now. It's because the passion is all there, the drive, and you don't want to lose it, and you think if you take a step back, I know I just told you guys to take a step back, but, you know, it's like if you take a step back, it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, you're going to miss this opportunity, but at the same time, it's, it's worth it. You know, it's it's the smiles. It's you know, it's that one student that asks to come and play the ukulele on Cook Island Language Week when there's only three, like, you know, three of us at a table. It's the little things that let us know that Pacifica are out there. We want to do this for you guys. You know, we we get a lot of love and passion out of it just to see that you guys are excelling like we want you to. So, hope that answered your question. Time for one more question. Sale yeah. from Ara. Another, another student to student question. Um, I just want to say hey to Haley for holding it down for our social working students. I'm a year three at Ada. 
Um, I heard the, the word well-being being thrown around quite a bit, and um, as a, I guess, overworked student, um, what, what kinds of things do you, do you guys as students put in place um, to be able to practice you know, well-being or, or to keep up your mental fitness or mental toughness, if that makes sense? MJ, want to add to that? Because you have anything to um, I guess, to be honest, I, I do things quite differently to what majority of people do. So probably leading back to what Matalena was saying about extracurricular activities. So I'm quite involved in... So me being involved in the New, Ze the New Zealand Tongue and Tertiary Students Association, that's like my coping mechanism to keep me on track with my studies. So when I was first elected on this um, association, I was an undergrad like literally scraping to the finish line to finish my BCom. And um, I'm still president, and now I'm doing my first year of doctorate. This year has been a lot harder because after being part of um, the Tupitai internship program, I've kind of been like, oh my gosh, like I have to grab every opportunity because I don't know if I'll get it again. Um, and it's been hard, but um, it depends on, like each person has their own coping mechanism. And even though it's, you don't want your rates as a tertiary institution to go down, like passing rates and stuff. You kind of have to let students make their mistakes, otherwise they won't learn. Because um, if you tell them, it's, it's like, I'll just go to the Bible. You know, people didn't believe until they saw. So students, are not, they're not going to believe what you tell them until it happens to them themselves. No one's going to believe the fire is hot until they touch it and they burn. So... I guess in saying that, um, you, it's, it's up to you to explore. You know, everyone's not going to be the same. For me, it's that that helps me stay on track with my studies. Um, I used to um, stay on track with rugby, but it was rugby was something I had to sacrifice um, because I was more passionate about this than um, being healthy. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know. You will eventually have to make a choice, but it, yeah, I guess as a student, find what your coping mechanism is, and uh, and um, and navigate your way so that it doesn't affect your um, your studies. I'm still trying to to balance that out, but I have to learn to walk on my own for it to work. Otherwise, like there's no point of learning anything. Thank you. Um, now we're gonna hand it over to Ayono Mino cleverly. He's gonna come uh, summarize our student panel, and uh, yeah, hand it over to him. Uh, first of all, let's give a big hand to our students, please, our learners. I just explained to you how we got to this. Uh, we have an, in our planning, we wanted an, an emphasis on our learners to be centred on our learners. And I thought, well, our student panel should be centred on them too. And I, and I thought, we need to have a youth, someone younger, doing the MCing of this. And I said to Ali, Ali, would you mind being the MC? Silence. And I think you know in our culture what silence means. Uh, not really. <laughs> so I said, come on, Ali, you can do it. I'll, I'll sit by you. And you notice I was sitting down there because I wanted to give the focus on our young people and one wonderful answers they gave us. And I think what really struck me was when uh, we were told not many of you have thought about asking the students. Wasn't that powerful? And I think they were all very nervous. And Ali asked me, what if we run out of, what if we have too much time? And I said, well, just put it over to the floor and they can ask you questions. Uh, I looked around, conscious of the uh, questions being, or the, of the discussion, and I saw two people resting their eyes, only two. And they were from the Grey Brigade. Um, and I'm very conscious there's a lot of a Grey Brigade up here during the forum. So I'm really glad our young people have taken this opportunity They've grasped it, 
they've showed us how professional they are, and I think any of these young people would do well in a job interview, because you had that comment earlier that some people come to a job interview and they don't say much. Well, I think we've got some very uh, aspiring future leaders here, and let us keep nurturing them. Thank you, Ayono. Um, just on behalf of us students up here, I'd just like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to voice our concerns and, and actually listen to the student, vo um, student body and student voices of Pacific students across Aotearoa, New Zealand. So um, that's what this panel is called, The Conch, so, you know, so we can voice the sh um, what we think, what we feel, and, and whatnot. But um, you know, this, from last year, the feedback was you know, we want students at this PTF and, and we bought it and hopeful for next year we have more students. So we've got 25 students, roughly 25 students here in the room. Hopefully we can double that next year and have more of our ITOs and PTE students jump on board and we want to have a, not just a university and ITP panel but one where there's someone from every aspect of the, um, a, a student from every aspect of tertiary education uh, represented. So, um, lucky I'm, I'm a, I've got a trade background, so I, I had your back out there. So, um, but uh, other than that, just want to thank you so much for allowing us uh, to speak and um, take part here today.